magic uh, mushrooms are going to be decriminalized. In Denver, done. voters and electing to make the city the first. We've become the first city in America to decriminalize magic mushrooms. On May 7, 2019, Denver voted to become the first city in America to decriminalize magic mushrooms. On the night of the victory, campaign organizer Kevin Matthews announced that he was taking the movement nationwide. Our success tonight will be a signal to the rest of the country that these kinds of campaigns are viable. That if individuals choose to unite behind the idea of changing the laws around psilocybin, it can happen. A few weeks later, Oakland decriminalized all psychedelic plants and fungus. That motion passes unanimously. Santa Cruz, California, followed in Oakland's footsteps on January 29th. And now statewide efforts are underway in Washington State, Oregon, and California. When it comes to psychedelics, we feel people should have the freedom of choice to choose what they want, and in essence, cognitive liberty. Ryan Dunover is the head of Decriminalize California, which is looking to take the movement one step further. The group seeks to convince California voters not only to eliminate laws that prohibit the possession and consumption of psychedelic mushrooms, but to create a legal framework for commercial sales. We realized, all right, let's make sure nobody else goes to jail for this. Let's give it a proper regulated system and let's make sure nobody creates a Bureau of Cannabis Control model for mushrooms because that'll just screw up everything. And we realized in order to do that, you'd actually have to, in essence, legalize sales. But Dunover's approach is proving controversial within the movement among those who seek decriminalization as a path to communing with nature. We led from a place of love. That is, we didn't push commodification. We pushed equitable access and just decriminalizing our relationship with nature. Carlos Plazola is the head of Decriminalized Nature in Oakland, which is geared towards removing barriers for city residents who want to exercise the right to experience these naturally occurring substances. The city basically said, we recognize the healing effect of these plants. So the citizenry hears that and says, oh, I'm, I'm curious now. And because it's sanctioned, people are stepping into those healing spaces with less fear, which leads to less bad trips. Plazola, a veteran political operative in Oakland, runs his operation out of The Haven, a community center that serves as a hub where members of the Bay Area's psychedelic community gather to share their experiences in what have become known as integrative circles, such as this one hosted by the LA-based group Psychedelia Integration. People come and talk about their psychedelic experiences and unpack them in a supportive group setting. Danielle Negrin of San Francisco Psychedelic Society says these gatherings are a place for those who've had intense psychedelic trips to talk with others and to share information about their use in therapy and in treating addiction. Sometimes these experiences can really transform a person, change them, open up their mind in ways they had never accessed before. We provide community and connection and support for people so that they can go through these experiences knowing that they're not alone. Decriminalization is a risk reduction strategy. We're allowing a space for people to come together. We're allowing people to feel less concerned about the, the risk that might be for coming out. Larry Norris runs Erie, another group that facilitates integration circles, and says the decriminalization movement is just getting started and that he favors it over legalization, in which case the state would need to create a regulatory framework. An inalienable right to have our own relationship to nature. There's no reason for us to have to, uh, you know, go to a dispensary or go to a pharmaceutical company to get the things that we can grow out of the ground. My concern is to what degree will it attract the attention of individuals who maybe would not have been drawn to take a psychedelic, but who with all the media play and the cultural rumble about this figure, they could try it, but don't understand how to optimally structure the experience. Charles Grobe is the director of Adolescent and Child Psychiatry at UCLA Harborside and co-author of the landmark study involving the dosing of terminal cancer patients with psilocybin. He wants psychedelics to be used primarily in clinical settings for now. What we observed with this study was that our subjects to begin with were in great existential crisis. Their sense of self had eroded, the sense of continuity over time, often a sense of loss of meaning, loss of purpose. What we found with these psychedelics psychedelic experiences. Individuals reported they were often able to reestablish that sense of self, continuity with the previous parts of their lives, and strengthen their sense of meaning and purpose. Grobe is one of many scientists working in the field of psychedelic research, which has experienced several breakthroughs in recent years thanks to the decades-long effort of the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS. 
MAPS has funded studies treating PTSD in veterans with MDMA, commonly known as ecstasy. The results were so promising, the FDA designated it a breakthrough therapy, fast-tracking the approval process so that the treatment could be available by as early as 2021, pending completion of Phase three clinical trials. Grobe was inspired to become a doctor, enrolling in med school in the 70s after discovering the work of early psychedelic researchers while working the night shift at a lab. When psychedelics were first discovered in the early 40s and then really distributed to psychiatrists around the world in the 50s, it quickly became apparent that psychedelics had the potential to become the cutting edge of psychiatric research. Much of the original discoveries of particular major neurotransmitter systems in the brain came from preclinical research with psychedelics. What I found even of greater interest and even importance was the use of LSD and other psychedelics, particularly psilocybin, to treat various psychiatric disorders that did not respond well to conventional treatments. There were outstanding results reported from several studies designed to treat chronic alcohol abusers, finding that even with one treatment session with a psychedelic, well, with sometimes a brief psychotherapy, individuals would have dramatic remission of their severe disorder and simply stop drinking. It was noted that the best outcomes for those individuals who had what was described as a powerful mystical level experience, a powerful psycho-spiritual epiphany. So in a sense, the mystical mimetic properties of these drugs were highly unusual but Grobe is wary of making them available to the public without guidance from experienced professionals in a clinical setting. Nothing is without risk, and some individuals are going to be at greater risk than others. I've published a paper on potential adverse interactions between SSRI antidepressants and ayahuasca. Some individuals have some underlying risk for um, psychotic illness, whether it's uh, schizophrenia or the bipolar spectrum. The experience, particularly under adverse conditions, may push them over the edge into a psychotic state. People really should be and should understand they need to be in a very quiet setting, ideally out in nature, but protected. You're with someone at all times who is not tripping. But Dunover worries that legalizing only medical use will mean that many people who could benefit from psychedelics won't have access. To go through a psychedelic-assisted experience, the cost can be anywhere between like $2,500 to $7,000, which means basically only rich white people would be able to use it. This is a people's movement, and the FDA trials only help so a very small percentage of people. And there's a much broader range of people who maybe can't get into the cultural ethos of a clinical system, maybe can't afford a clinical system. So the concern around unleashing these medicines in a non-professional, non-controlled setting, it's already happening. And it's been happening for thousands of years. People have been working with psychedelics and healing with these medicines. Are we gonna accept that that's happening? or are we going to ignore that that's happening? Keep in mind that when they've been used since time memorial by indigenous peoples, there was a long record of use, always within the context of ritual ceremony. They were not recreational compounds. They were not taken with alcohol. We live in a very different culture where all bets are off. As for the effort to fully legalize psychedelics in California, the Attorney General's office approved the initiative's language in early January, and the campaign is currently collecting the 625,000 signatures it needs to qualify for the ballot. This thing is won or lost in the next five months as it is. My hope for the next five years for the decolonization movement is that it's an international movement, that it's being talked about at the United Nations, that every country in the world is having this conversation. They never should have been made illegal to begin with nor should any relationship between humans and nature be made illegal.